Hi there, this is chapter two of managerial accounting, and this chapter is managerial accounting and cost concepts. This is from the book Managerial Accounting for Managers. So learning objective 2-1 is to understand cost classification used for assigning costs to cost objects. And basically we have two kinds of costs that we look at from this perspective. We're gonna slice and dice costs in a lot of different directions today. Um, because we, what we really want to do is you want to understand how costs behave. That's going to be the next chapter. And in order to understand that, we have to understand what different kinds of costs we have. So let's talk about direct and indirect costs. Direct costs can be easily traced to the unit that's produced or whatever it is we're trying to trace the cost to. And the two most common kinds of direct costs are called direct materials and direct labor. Direct materials would be the actual physical goods that go into a specific item that you're making. And direct labor would be the actual amount of time, the cost of the time that an employee works on making the products that you sell. So for example, if you make this, if you're making staplers, then the cost of the plastic and the plastic and there's a little metal in here the metal that would be the direct materials and you would actually measure how much plastic goes into each stapler and then you would measure how much that plastic costs direct labor is that you pay an employee money to assemble the stapler and let's say an employee can assemble a staple a stapler in four minutes then four minutes of that employee's salary would be direct labor. Indirect labor is everything else, namely the, the one that we talk about most, uh, it's usually is manufacturing overhead. And that is the cost of running your factory. So you have a factory and you have to pay rent on the factory. You have to pay for electricity and other utilities. You have to pay property taxes. You have to pay managers to oversee the operations in the factory. And you also have to pay for all sorts of miscellaneous costs involved in running the factory. For example, um, there's probably glue around and there's paper towels in the bathroom and there's maintenance materials to keep the whole place clean. So these are materials, but they're not necessarily the materials that go into this making staplers. So those are called, those would be called indirect materials and they're part of overhead. And likewise, you may have labor, you have people working in the factory who are not making staples, but they're doing other things that the people who are making the staples really need. And those would be your indirect costs. So direct costs are direct materials and direct labor. Indirect costs are manufacturing overhead. Now let's talk a little bit more about these types of costs, materials, labor, and direct materials, direct labor, and direct overhead. Direct materials, direct labor, head, labor, and manufacturing overhead are the three types of costs that go into manufacturing goods. So again, direct materials are the raw materials that become part of the product and can be easily traced to it. So here you can see they're making, I don't know, cookies or something. So a certain amount of flour needs to go into the dough. And that would be your raw materials for making cookies. Direct labor would be the amount of time that actual employees work to make the product. So if you have employees who are shaping the cookies and kneading the dough and making them, then you would figure out how long does it take the average employee on average to make a single product and how much do I pay that employee on average? And you figure out the direct labor cost of each product, for example, each cookie here in the video. And manufacturing overhead is everything else. Manufacturing costs, manufacturing overhead can't be traced directly to the specific products, but it's still necessary to make the products. So examples here they give are lubricants, cleaning supplies needed to maintain the bakery equipment, wages paid to employees who are not directly involved in production, but they're still needed for production, like cleanup workers, janitors, security guards, and might I add, managers who run the factory. Manufa managers are overhead. 
And then we have non-manufacturing costs. So non-manufacturing costs would consist of selling costs, which are the costs needed to make, get the product, um, to sell the product and deliver it to the customer. And administrative costs would be executive, organizational costs, those types of costs needed to run your company. Now, the manager who runs the factory would be overhead, but a manager who just works for the company and may run something in the company would be considered administrative. So there's an important difference there because the manager who runs the factory, he is or she is, a ma is manufacturing overhead and manufacturing costs. Whereas a manager who just works in headquarters and works on manufacturing and lots of other things too would be administrative costs. And then learning objective 2-3 Understand cost classifications used to prepare financial statements, product versus period costs. A lot of students in this class, for some reason, um, have problems with this. Product costs are the costs of making and producing the products that you sell. Really, your manufacturing costs are product costs. Period costs are the non-manufacturing costs. And the difference between these are very important because Product costs are going to be inventory until you sell the product. Whereas period costs are, and then when you sell the product, it's going to be cost of goods sold and expense. Period costs are going to be an expense as soon as you spend the money, or really as soon as you use the item that creates the expense. So for example, when I make a stapler, the cost of that stapler is inventory because I still own the stapler and the stapler is sitting in a stock room someplace. When I sell the stapler, it becomes cost of goods sold and goes to the income statement as an expense. Whereas when I spend money on a period cost, such as selling costs, that would be an expense that shows up on the income statement. I mentioned managers before. The manager in a factory is going to be manufacturing overhead and therefore be a product cost. He's going to, he or she is going to be manufacturing overhead. It's going to be a product cost and part of the cost of the inventory. And then when you sell the stapler, their salary is going to be cost of goods sold. The cost of a manager in headquarters, that person does manufacturing, but they do a lot of other things too, is going to be an administrative expense. And therefore, it's going to be recorded on the in income statement as they earn their income. And um, the question comes up, and we're not going to get into it in this chapter yet, but we're going to get into it in a future chapter, is what do you do when you, how do you assign manufacturing overhead to products? So I have a stapler, right? I know how much plastic and materials goes into the stapler. I know how much direct labor goes into the stapler. How much manufacturing overhead goes into the stapler? I got all these costs of running the factory. I got rent. I got a manager. I got, um, I got maintenance, I got security, all sorts of different costs. How do I assign those costs to staplers? And that's going to be for a future chapter. Don't worry about it yet. And then we have what's called prime and conversion costs. Direct materials and direct labor are called prime costs. And direct labor and manufacturing overhead are called conversion costs. Now let me explain what these are. Prime cost is the main, is, prime can pretty much be considered to be a synonym of direct cost. Conversion cost is the cost of taking materials and converting them to the finished goods. So here's a great way to think about this is you have an assembly line and direct materials that would be, in this case, they're making cars, so that would probably be metal rubber, other various raw materials that the factory buys from the outside, go into the assembly line, and then direct labor and manufacturing overhead is the cost of, con of working on those units. And then when you're finished, you have finished goods on the right side. So raw materials, direct materials go into the production process. People work on it, and that requires both direct labor and overhead. And then when you're done, you have finished goods. So that's what conversion costs are. Prime costs would be, and I circle them here, or I put a blue box, a yellow box around them to try to illustrate this.
So direct costs and indirect costs are used to assign costs to what we call cost objects. And we have manufacturing costs as shown here, exhibit 2-1 would be direct materials, direct labor and overhead, non-manufacturing would be selling and administrative. We use the system of product costs and period costs to account to prepare our financial statements. Product costs are gonna, gonna become cost of goods sold. Period costs will be recorded as expenses immediately underneath gross profit. Remember the order of the income statement, we'll go back to that in a minute. Sales minus, gross, minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit, minus selling and administrative costs equals operating income. But we use another set of cost classifications to better understand how costs behave. And this would be variable costs, fixed costs, and mixed costs. I'm going to go over that in a minute. And we use this idea of differential costs to make decisions. Again, we'll go over this in a minute. Let's start off, though, by going back over this. We have direct materials, direct labor of 35,000, manufacturing overhead of 14,000, selling expenses of 29,000, and administrative expenses of 50,000. This is the cost classifications template. So let's calculate this now. If we were to calculate the direct materials, that would be, um, I'm sorry, product cost, that would consist of direct materials, direct labor, of 35,000 and manufacturing overhead of 14,000. So total product cost would equal $118,000. Now period cost would be costs that are not manufacturing costs. So in this case, your period costs would be selling expenses and administrative expenses, selling expenses of 29,000, administrative expenses of 50,000. So total period cost is $79,000. Conversion costs, remember, are direct labor and manufacturing overhead. Direct labor here is 35,000, manufacturing overhead is 14,000. So total conversion costs are 49,000. And prime costs are like direct costs, that would be direct materials and direct labor. In this case, direct materials is 69,000 and direct labor is 35,000. So total prime cost is gonna be $104,000. Learning objective 2-4. Let's talk about cost behavior. What we mean by cost behavior is understanding what causes costs to increase or decrease. Having an idea of when costs change and also when costs change the same. And the three basic classifications we have are what we call variable costs, fixed costs, and mixed costs. The way variable costs work is that they change in proportion to the level of activity. So this is this example here is pretty dated. In the old days, it used to be that you were charged by per text by your cell phone company. So each text was like 10 cents or 20 cents or something. And the more text that you sell, you send, or I'll remember receive, the more text that you send, the more the um, phone company charges you. And I remember like when I first had a cell phone or no, this was somewhat after that, but when I got married and we had cell phones, we would like try to keep down the number of texts because texts were expensive. They cost 20 cents each. And if you send a lot of texts, then it really starts to add up. So you don't want to waste any texts. Anyway, each text costs 20 cents. The more texts that you have, the more money the company, the phone company is going to charge you. Looked at a different way, no matter how many texts you send, the total cost, the cost per text is going to be the same. It's going to be 20 cents per text. So each text is going to be 20 cents and that's it. So if you look at this in total, the total cost will be in proportion to the total number of texts. And the individual cost per unit, variable cost per unit is always going to be the same. It's going to be constant. 
And then we have the idea of the activity base. And this is whatever you're measuring that creates the variable cost. So in the previous example, we had the number of texts. The more texts you sent, the greater the cost. Here, if you're running a factory, it could be the number of units produced. If you're driving a car, it could be the number of miles driven. If you're operating a machine, it could be the number of hours that you use the machine. If you have employees working, it could be the number of hours that the employees work, labor hours. And this is whatever the activity base is, the cost driver, so to speak, the more of this thing that you have, the greater the cost. Fixed costs, on the other hand, do not change. So whether you have a lot of units or very few units, the total cost is the same. This is like with a cell phone when you have a contract and you have unlimited texting. So you pay $10 a month and you can send as many texts as you want. Or we have now, we have unlimited, right? Within a certain range, or we have unlimited voice, or you may have a certain, you may have 1,200 minutes of voice on your cell phone. So as long as you use the number of minutes within that number, then the total cost is going to be the same and it's not going to change. That would be called a fixed cost. Fixed costs don't change regardless of the activity base or the cost driver. Now, the cost per unit, when you have fixed cost, the cost per unit is going to go down because the more minutes you use, then the average cost per minute is going to be lower and lower. So if you use one minute, then the cost per minute is going to be ridiculously high, let's say $50 for that one minute. On the other hand, if you use 1,000 minutes, then the cost per minute is going to be very low, a couple of cents. So fixed cost in total is not going to change, but the fixed cost per unit is going to go down. Um, I joined a gym a few years ago, and I decided that I wanted my cost per visit to be as low as possible. I don't want them to make any money on me. So, it, you know, it's a monthly charge. I don't know what it is. Let's say it's $50 a month. So if I go once a month, then it costs $50. If I go every day for the month, 30 days, right, then it's a dollar and change per, per visit. So I want to have maximize, I want to minimize my fixed cost per unit and therefore go as often as possible. Whereas if I chose a different plan where you pay per visit, that would be a variable cost. So we have two types of fixed costs and what we call committed costs and discretionary costs. Committed costs are long term, pretty much you already spent the money and you can't change them. So it could be depreciation on a building or real estate taxes. As long as you own the building, you have to pay those real estate taxes and that's it. So committed fixed costs are truly fixed in that no matter how much money you spend, you cannot change them. So if you have a cell phone contract, then there is a fixed cost there because the only way to eliminate that cost is by canceling your contract. Discretionary costs, on the other hand, are, um, can be changed. So you may have some costs that are fixed, but you have the ability to cancel them or to perhaps even increase them if you want and increase those fixed costs. But just because they're discretionary doesn't necessarily mean they're variable and that they change in line as a constant in relation to volume. Now we also have the idea of relevant range. Relevant range means that these assumptions about fixed and variable only exist within a certain range of volume. So for example, if you have a cell phone contract that gives you a thousand minutes per month, and that works, the numbers all work till you get up to a thousand minutes. Then if you've ever gone over on your cell phone, you know what happens. You're completely out of your relevant range and everything changes completely. So when we talk about fixed and variable cost, we're really only talking about the relevant range because outside the relevant range, all sorts of strange things can happen. And we have to be wary of that when we make decisions. So let's assume office space is available at 30,000 at a rate of $30,000 a year in increments of a thousand square feet. Fixed costs would increase in a step fashion at a rate of 30,000 for each additional thousand square feet. So we would have a certain number 
of square feet that we're renting. And as long as we stay within that number of square feet, then rent is fixed. But if we decide to increase the square feet, then it's not fixed anymore and it's going to change. So here's a good example of what this would look like. And this is called a step cost in that up to a thousand square feet is going to be 30,000 from a thousand to 2000 square feet is going to be 60,000 2000 to 3000 would be 90,000. So if we're within a thousand, let's say we're renting 1900 square feet, we'd be within our relevant range. But if we exceed 2000 square feet, then we're going to go outside of our relevant range. And again, let's just emphasize here that variable costs increase in total or decrease in relation to activity level, whereas fixed costs do not change as long as you stay within your relevant range. Per unit, variable cost is going to be the same. You know, it's it costs a dollar twenty cents per text, no matter how many texts you send. Fixed costs, if you have a fixed contract and you have a thousand texts you can send or unlimited texts, fixed cost is always going to be the same. And it doesn't matter how many or how few texts you send, it's going to be the same. Now that means that the average cost per text is going to go down the more text that you send. We also have something called mixed costs. And the way mixed costs work is that they're a combination of variable and fixed. So utility cost is a good example of that, where there's a component, and the fact is your cell phone probably is good. Cell phones are also fit mixed costs because there are fixed components like fixed monthly charges, and then there may be charges that vary with the number of phone calls you make. Actually, most people don't even have that anymore. So a utility bill might be like that, where part of it is fixed, and part of it is variable. And that means that you have to break those numbers out so that you can figure out what the fixed component is and what the variable is. And you can show this as an equation, y equals a plus bx. a being the fixed costs, b being variable costs, x being the number of units of activity, and y being total cost. So if you take the fixed costs and you add the variable cost per unit, times the number of units, you'll get the total cost. And the only way to figure this out is you got to figure out what your fixed cost is and what your variable cost per unit. And analyzing mixed costs requires extended analysis to try to figure out what the fixed component is versus what the variable component is. Two ways to do this would be with what's called an account analysis, where you simply do a little bit of analysis of the data. And from experience, you estimate how the costs behave. And I'll show you how to do this in just a moment. The other way to do this is what's called an engineering approach, where you would have an engineer come and figure out and do the math and figure out this is how much time it should take someone to make something. This is how much we pay them. And Based on that mathematical analysis, estimate what variable cost per unit and fixed cost should be. So some of the methods that we're going to talk about now are what's called scatter graph and high-low. So let's go to NUKSAC Expeditions template. And let's first look at variable costs. Variable cost per unit is $30 a unit. And we're dealing here with meals. So each meal is $30 a guest. So if you have 250 guests, then the total cost would be 250 times 30 or 7,500. If you had 500 guests, and you could fill the rest of this out, 15,750 guests would be 22,005 and a thousand guests times $30 a guest would be $30,000. Now fixed costs are different. Let's say monthly rental is $500. Then no matter how many guests you have, the monthly rental is going to be $500. But what would the average cost per guest be? It would be, if you had 250 guests, it would be $500 divided by 250, it would be $2. Now if you had 500 guests, then it would be a dollar a guest. If you have 
750 gas would be 500 divided by 750 or 67 cents a gas. And if you have 1,000 gas, then it would be 50 cents a gas. But total co fixed cost is going to stay at $500. Mixed costs are going to be a little more complicated. Let's suppose that we have a $25,000 license fee per year plus $3 per rafting um, part. Then the formula Y equals, so the formula would be that total mixed costs would be equal to the fixed cost, that's $25,000, plus the variable cost per unit, $3, times X, would be the number of rafting parties. So as long as you know the number of rafting parties, then you would be able to figure out what the total cost should be. It would be $25,000 a year total. The number of rafting parties times three would give you the total cost. And here's a picture of what that would look like. So the more rafting parties that you have, the greater the cost. But even if you have zero rafting parties, you still have a minimum cost of $25,000. Now we have here Brent Line Hospital. Again, these problems are from the book. So if you want to look in the book, I, they're on, it's on page 35 of the book. And um, this just explains what's in the book, and that's all I'm trying to do in this. That's all I'm trying to do here. So we have here the number of patient days per month, by month, and we have the total maintenance cost. We're trying to establish what the relationship is. We could do a scatter graph as shown here. And this clearly it shows that the more patient days, the greater the maintenance cost, because when you have patients, they kind of they require more maintenance. So there's a positive relationship but it's not exactly straight. And it's also clear that when you're at the, there's a certain component that's fixed because even if, with a minimum number of patient days, you still have some maintenance costs every day. So we want to break out the mixed cost into its fixed and variable component and come up with a formula very much like what we came up with over here. And so the formula would be, the first thing we could do is what's called the high-low method. And the funny thing is, is you may be like when you took bath and you learned about this y equals mx plus b and m equals dy divided by dx, you're probably saying to yourself, when am I ever going to use this? And now here's one more thing that you're going to say, when am I ever going to use this? No, that's a joke, right? This Here, you're going to use it. And this is actually very useful because you want to be able to predict what costs are going to be. So variable cost is going to be dy dx. In other words, you're going to choose the highest activity level and the lowest activity level. I'll highlight them for you right now. Your highest activity level is right here. And your lowest activity level is March. Right here. So what you want to do is you want to look at the difference between the highest and the lowest. And that would be the extreme scatter point graph here at the right and at the left and pretty much draw a line between them and figure out what the slope is. So dy dx would be change in cost divided by change in activity level. So if we were going to calculate that, let's, let's figure it out. We got our high activity level in June. And we have a low activity level in March. And we have activity level would be patient days. And we have maintenance costs incurred. Those are the two numbers that we want to keep track of. That's why. So activity level at high level is 8,000. And at low is 5,000. And maintenance cost at high level is 9,800. And at low level is 7,400. So the difference between these would be that would be dy dx. dy would be 2400 and dx would be 3000. So dy change in cost would be 2400. The change in activity is 3000 and therefore the slope i.e. the variable cost per unit is going to be 80 cents per unit. So now you know your variable cost. 
we don't know yet the total cost. So, but we know that the fixed cost equals the total cost minus the variable cost. So, right, because total cost equals fixed cost plus variable cost. So therefore, fixed cost equals total cost minus variable cost. It's simple algebra. So fixed cost here would be the total cost. And we know that total cost, let's take as an example um, the high level. Total cost would be 9,800. And the variable cost would be 80 cents times 8,000. Let me do it this way. Right, it's 80 cents is the variable cost per unit times 8,000 units. So that would be 9,800 minus 6,400 would be $3,400, would be the total fixed cost. So if you wanted to give this a formula, you would get y equals um, the fixed cost, 3,400, plus the variable cost times the number of units. And that would be your cost formula. 3,400 plus 0.80 times x. Another approach that you can take is what's called least squares regression. And least squares regression, you would plug in the formulas using Excel. It's kind of outside the scope of this video, but you have treatment of this, I think, in the appendix of the book that explains how to do this. I think it's somewhere. Let me... explaining how to do this. And basically, if you plug in this data into a regression formula, then you're going to get, as your, as your, um, your fixed factor, 3431, that would be what's called your y-intercept. And 0.759 would be the slope. And excuse me, your alpha and your beta. So 3431 would be the alpha in a regression, or A. And 0.759 would be your first beta, your slope coefficient. And that's pretty close to what we got here. I should note that the two methods work differently, and um, high-low versus the regression method. And that you would expect because they work differently, obviously. The thing is that the high-low method only uses two data points, whereas regression uses more data points. And it could also be argued that high-low uses the most extreme data points, and that's also a problem. So least squares regression is really more accurate, and if you know how to use it, it is probably a better method to use. Learning Objective 2-6. Income statements you can use a, a different format based on fixed and variable costs. So we know the traditional format. And let me pull up Excel here. Here you can see Exhibit 2-9, and you can see the traditional format would be, I wrote it at the bottom, sales minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit or gross margin, minus selling and administrative costs equals net operating income. Well, what we can do is we can adjust this format to what's called a contribution format or contribution margin format based on variable and fixed expenses. And what we do is we go sales minus variable costs equals contribution margin minus fixed costs equals operating income. And the thing about the contribution format income statement is it aligns with how you how costs actually behave. So that sales and variable expenses, if if your variable expenses is based on a measure of sales, then variable expenses should move in proportion to sales. And the more sales you have, the more variable expenses. So contribution margin is equal to sales minus variable expenses. And this is going to be a very important relationship that we're going to come back to in the next few classes. Sales minus variable expenses equals contribution margin. And again, minus fixed expense equals net operating income. Let's go over how cost of goods sold is calculated. You should re have seen this in financial accounting, but we'll go over it again. Cost of goods sold equals beginning merchandise inventory plus purchases minus ending merchandise inventory. And cost of goods sold should, in theory, be a variable cost. But in fact, it can have a component that's also fixed. Cost, so if we have purchases of 3000 beginning merchandise inventory of 7,000 and ending merchandise inventory of 4,000, then cost of goods sold would be beginning inventory 
plus the purchases, minus the ending inventory, or in this case, $6,000. That's how they got the number here. So this is a formula worth writing down and remembering. And we're going to be talking a lot about this contribution format income statement in the next few classes. And I should just note while we're at it that whichever method you use, traditional income statement is the gap method, and that's how companies report their income in their financial statements. But the contribution margin format income statement is actually much more useful. And regardless of which method you use, net operating income should be the same because it should include your sales and all of your expenses in it. Learning Objective 2-7, understand cost classifications used in making decisions, differential costs, opportunity costs, and sunk costs. And so when we make decisions, we always want to think about what costs are and how costs are going to be impacted by these decisions. Every decision involves a choice between different alternatives, and the goal is to focus on your different costs and determine whether or not they're relevant to a decision. Either they're relevant or they're irrelevant. And so we would look to see if they're relevant or not and then how they would be impacted by different decisions. So let's say you have a job paying $1,500 a month in your hometown. You have a job offer in a neighboring city that pays $2,000 a month and the cost of commuting is $300 a month. So your differential revenue here, if you go to the neighboring city, you would make another $500 a month, but you would have to pay an additional $300 a month for um, the additional commuting. So how much more would you make? You would make an additional $200 a month. And that's what you want to do is really focus on the difference from one place to another. There's also something called opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is the benefit you would give up when you choose one alternative over another. So if you're not attending college, you could be earning $15,000 a year. So your opportunity cost for attending college is $15,000. We, um, I work in the Department of Accounting here, and oftentimes students have a decision to make whether they want to do accounting, get their accounting degree in four years or five. There's a tremendous opportunity cost that they're giving up. If you choose to stay for five years, you may be giving up a full year's of salary, which could be $60,000. So that extra year carries this tremendous opportunity cost that students need to think about whether or not it's worth. Of course it is worth it. I believe it's worth it. And then there's something called sunk costs. And sunk cost is a cost that you incurred that just can't be changed. And therefore it's irrelevant. So you bought gold for $2,200 an ounce and now it's selling for $1,000 an ounce. So you think about selling the gold and you might say, well, I paid 2,200. There's no way I'm going to take such a big loss because I spent so much money on this. I've got to make money on it. And the thing is that the amount of money that you paid is irrelevant. You just want to maximize the amount of revenue you would receive if you could sell it. So the actual amount of money you paid should not affect your decision. And Let's, um, let, let, let's look at a more complex example right now. This is natural cosmetics, and there's no, there's no template for this because I just took it right out of the book so you could see it. You can see here that right now you have a retailer, distribu di retailer distribution system that have sales of $700,000 and various different costs that may change depending on the decision. So expenses are five forty, dollars and their income is one sixty. dollars they have a new proposal in front of them to use sales representatives. And they expect that if they do this, sales will increase by $100,000. And then some of the costs are also going to change. So you can see here, fixed costs would go down, variable costs would go up, warehouse depreciation would go up, and other expenses would stay the same. Now you may, and so wait, let me just, I'll just explain. Total expenses is 625. And net operating income would be $175,000. So if you look at the difference here, you would see that if you choose the sales representative's approach, there would be additional operating income, net operating income of $15,000. So that would say that you probably should do this, that this, is, this would be a good decision because it would increase your net operating income. 
that you might ask the question of why fixed costs are changing. I thought they're fixed. Well, the argument would be here, I guess, that if we take on sales representatives, then some of our relevant ranges are going to move around and we need to take that into consideration. So some of the fixed costs would change. Commissions would be created. We wouldn't have any commissions if we just had a retail or distribution, whereas we're going to need to start paying commissions if we have sales representatives. So this would be an ex another example of how you would make these types of decisions. My son was showing me a video, and um, I thought it would be relevant to the class, so I, maybe you should watch it. It's on YouTube. It says, I opened the world's cheapest store. And if you go to this, you'll see that there is a video link nearby. I don't know where. It's in black. I'm posting it to Blackboard. I'm also going to post it to the comments um, in YouTube. And um, I want you to watch this video now. It's 15 minutes. And then come back to this video. So here's a summary of what happened. And if you haven't watched the video and you skipped over the video, you should really watch it. It's very entertaining. In two days, they brought in $257 in revenue. Their expenses, they said, were $35,000. So they suffered a net loss. They opened a store where everything is a dollar, and then they changed the price to a penny to see if that helps. It doesn't help. <coughs> they lose $34,742.80. And you can see that in the video if you like. The ROI on that is a negative 99.3%, meaning that they lost almost the entire $35,000 investment. And what's funny is that they keep talking in the video like if only they could get more sales. You think people would buy this? If we just sold more stuff, we would make more money, right? So what would happen if they increase sales? What would happen is they would lose even more money because they're taking things that cost several hundred dollars <laughs> and they're selling them for a dollar. In some cases, they're selling them for a penny. So naturally, the more they sell, the more money that they're going to lose. So it's important to understand the relationship. Expenses are almost proportionate to revenue here, except that expenses are several times or like 100 times revenue or more. And therefore, the more they sell, the more money that they lose. But that's not the whole story because we're thinking about you got it when you ever you think about a business you have to think about how a business makes money so you could still watch the video and say wow how they do this why would they waste thirty five thousand dollars on this insane video right where they're just basically giving free stuff away to people it, it seems like a huge waste of money and everyone in there looked very happy you know i just got a big screen tv for a dollar or I got a PlayStation for a penny or a Nintendo Switch for a penny. The customers look really happy, but why would you go into a venture like this is what you might ask yourself. Well, let's change the income statement a little bit, okay? And let's look at what really happened. They're not in the business of selling merchandise. They're in the business of selling advertisement. And the rule of thumb on YouTube is that they make about a five dollars advertising revenue per thousand views it varies depending on what kind of advertising you attract but the rule of thumb i saw this in the wall street journal a few months ago was that a pro the rule a good rule of thumb is five dollars for each thousand views as of this video today um they had ten thousand five hundred eighty four ten million five hundred eighty four thousand views and they were ranked like number three or four in trending. At $5 each, that would be $52,920 in advertising revenue. And now if you add everything together, their net income would be $18,177 with an ROI of 51.9%, which is very, very, very respectable. Now the thing is, is that this is trending right now on YouTube. So chances are the number of views is going to increase and therefore they're going to, with every additional view, every thousand views, you can up your advertising revenue another $5. And what's very interesting here is that to think about your expenses aren't really variable. If you think about expenses in terms of selling things for a dollar, then expenses vary by the dollar, right? Because your, all your, the cost of buying things is variable in proportion to the, co the revenue you receive from selling it. But that's not really the business that this Mr. Beast store is in. 
this Mr. Beast store is in the business of selling advertisement. And from that perspective, they spent $35, 35, a little less than $35,000 making the video. And that is fixed. You could even argue that it's sunk. It's not going to be, it's not going to be able to be changed, but every dollar of revenue is variable, right? Cause revenue is by, by its nature variable. So every dollar that comes in will not have any additional expenses that come with it. So each $5 for every thousand views will just go straight to your bottom line, to your net income and increase it. So chances are, as this has more views and you can watch when you watch the video, see how many views there are. And you can just think about how much money these guys are making because um, chances are by the time you watch this video, the amount of income they've made from this will have multiplied to thirty, forty thousand dollars even a video. So you have to think about a business in terms of what they really do. And in this case, again, they're not in the business of selling PlayStations and Nintendo Switches and all the other things they're selling in the stores, gift cards selling $25 gift cards for a dollar. That's not their business at all. Their business is to sell advertisement and they did an excellent job of selling advertising here and the return that they're earning as a result of it is phenomenal. One more thing to think about this is that what would have happened if it failed? In other words, what if they sold all this stuff for a dollar, they posted it to YouTube and they didn't get any views? Then they would have lost $35,000. Okay, this is the end of chapter two and um, next step is to work on the homework. Thank you.